Welcome everybody again to the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the humans behind the really big ideas that are going to be shaping the future, uh, inspiring future creation, and for all those that like really good stories. I'm Ira Pastor. I'm your uh, longevity, health, and aging ambassador along for this journey. Uh, so, you know, on several recent shows, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, the various therapeutic and preventive interventions for human health, disease, degeneration, aging, that are being developed in the private sector of the economy, both here in the U.S. Uh, and abroad. Uh, we've also had some representatives from various agencies of the United States government joining us to discuss many of the uh, exciting public sector discoveries and developments occurring, some a little further abroad, uh, that have trickle-down effects uh, for the U.S. public. Uh, in recent months, the Idea Me Show has profiled several uh, guests that have uh, been at NASA uh, talking about a range of topics, uh, including the biodynamics of uh, suborbital flight training and astrobiology per the uh, International Space Station. Uh, we even talked a little bit about isolation chamber uh, training for the uh, psychological dynamics of future missions to Mars. Um, a lot of very interesting topics. Today, uh, we are going to go in a, another direction. I'm extremely excited about our guest because we're going to take a path that pertains to the topics of human repair, regeneration, health, as a truly unique and convergent set of experiences, both the private and public sectors. And it's gonna be a really fascinating show. Uh, and, and our guest today uh, is Dr. Wendy Dean. Uh, Dr. Dean uh, has a medical degree from the University of Massachusetts Medical School. She specialized in psychiatry and was in clinical private practice for about 15 years uh, before she transitioned into military medical research. Uh, she served in a role as the medical officer and assistant director for the Tissue Injury and Regenerative Medicine Program Management Office, uh, the Un United States Army's Medical Research and Material Command where she oversaw development, clinical translation, and funding of various emerging medical technologies that pertain to combat injuries. And uh, in August of 2018, Dr. Dean became the Senior Vice President of Operations and Senior Medical Officer at the Henry M. Jackson Foundation for the Advancement of Military Medicine, which is a global nonprofit organization created by Congress in 1983, has uh, 2,600 personnel, and is focused on accelerating progress in military medicine, serving as a, a very important link between the military community, medical community, private sector, and, and millions of American service families and veterans. Uh, all that, Dr. Dean, thank you so much for offering to join us on the show today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thanks for coming. Um, we, you know, we typically start out by, by giving our guests the floor just so we can learn more about you, um, your background, how you got interested in science and medicine, how you got into psychiatry, and ultimately your journey through both the private and military sectors, and, and basically how... In 2019, you find yourself at the epicenter of both uh, in what is arguably one of the hottest areas of, of biomedical research and development. So um, I, don't, I really don't remember a time when I wasn't interested in medicine. When I was, uh, apparently I told my parents when I was in fourth grade that that's what I was going to do. And <laughs> I did not veer off that path. I went to medical school at UMass, as you said, and then went and did my training at Dartmouth in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And I actually started my training as a surgery resident, did that for three years, and realized that um, there were just too many things in life that I was really interested in and would not have time to do if I, was, if I were a surgeon. Um, so after three years, I went and spent two years in the emergency room practicing emergency medicine. And after that, um, I realized that psychiatry offered me um, some really interesting options because the, the brain was, and, and behavioral health is, is poorly understood. Um, the brain is still largely a black box for us. It's mm -hmm. not as much as it was 10 years ago, but it, it is still, there's a lot to be known. Sure. So I transitioned to psychiatry and practiced for about 10 years. And our, my family moved at that point. And it became clear that um, the practice that I had had in New Hampshire wasn't going to transition with me. Um, and so I, there was an opportunity to start working in the regenerative medicine uh, funding oversight. And I moved to that at, in, with the army. And since then I've, uh, I was there for about eight years 
And it was fascinating to me to see how the field developed just in that short period of time, because it, it is still, um, it was a very young field. Mm -hmm. And so there was, it was very dynamic. And I think as it has grown since then, it's become much more, um, you know, we were able to build in a lot of processes around it, some standards, um, and it's, it's now becoming um, a much more repeatable field, mm -hmm. which is very exciting to see, because that means that it's moving towards something that is repeatable and scalable and, and has more potential to move into the larger market. Mm -hmm. larger healthcare market. After, after seven years, seven and a half years at the Medical Research and Material Command, um, an, an opportunity came to move over to HJF, the Henry Jackson Foundation, and um, being one step away from the government, being outside of the, the public sphere, allows us at HJF to think about how to bring in different partners and how to be the connective tissue between the government um, agency and some of the really promising research that's being done out in the private sector. Mm -hmm. But we serve as that function to connect those two. You know, it's an interesting uh, segue uh, in the sense that you know, before we, we talk about the different areas that uh, you specifically focus on at HAF, I, I wanted to just briefly touch on a, a topic that um, many might be quite unfamiliar with, and that sort of has to do with the, the scope, uh, sort of the range of biomedical related activities uh, that, you know, are conducted by the U.S. military. Um, you know, the, the, you know, the, the people, you know, um, the, the world can look at us and, you know, see our military budgets and they can see our aircraft carriers and submarines and helicopters and things like that. But they don't normally hear about the, the military's role in tissue engineering, as an example. You know, extremely important for uh, the active soldier, the wounded warrior, but at the same time, you know, potentially translatable in the future to you know, millions of people waiting for organ transplants. Uh, the same thing, you know, I, I was uh, a couple months ago, I was on a, a DARPA a uh, conference call uh, where, you know, they're focused on this biologic suspended animation, you know, focusing on this golden hour, as they put it, of, you know, when a life can be saved following a, a severe wound in battle. You know, once again, extremely important to the battlefield, at the same time, completely relevant to uh, emergency rooms, ICUs all over the country. Can you speak a little bit about your experience sort of in that world of, you know, the uh, sort of the, the military component to discovery and the wide range of uh, translation that potentially could come out of that? Because I don't think many or too many people are aware of, of just the uh, substantial amounts of investment that go on in these, I would call it the non-battlefield uh, you know, aspect of, of the military. Sure. So I think uh, if you keep in mind that almost two thirds of the folks who can't fight in a war are taken down not by combat injury, but by disease. Mm -hmm. um, so infectious disease, communicable diseases, um, foodborne illness, waterborne illness, um, vector-borne illnesses, all of those are also a huge component of making sure that we have a ready force. Mm -hmm. So um, everything from uh, infectious diseases, to combat trauma, to psychological trauma, to um, other, other impacts like radiation, mm -hmm. or even at this point, um, focused energy is, a, is something that folks are starting to think about. Mm -hmm. So even, even though we typically think just about um, blast injury, for example, mm -hmm. In the military, which is which is arguably a huge problem, we also have a vast. There's also a vast range of other um, illnesses or unfitting conditions that happen that we're that the that the military is very focused on, and that we're we are targeting to support. You know, when one visits the the Henry M. Jackson Foundation website, you know, there's a a clearly sort of a wide uh, continuum of of research that you're involved in. So you know, you see. 
um, activities or for the active service person, the soldier performance, uh, countermeasure defenses, infectious disease, uh, there's rehabilitation and casualty care, and then obviously the after, uh, you know, the after battle scenario, mental health, traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress, and, and then you're even involved in, in cancer research, so, you know, much longer term. So, could you could you talk for a little bit about you know what you're most excited about um, you know most interested in what you see as some of the shorter term opportunities that um, are are getting out there from the research and, and ultimately potentially translating into the private sector. I know there's a, there's a lot of topics here that can make for many <laughs> shows, but um, please you know love to hear from you on you know what you're most passionate about in, in this context. I have to tell you, it's really hard to pick a favorite child. <laughs> um, uh, there is so much exciting research happening in the Department of Defense right now and, and with our military partners. Um, so there are promising um, vaccine trials for Ebola, for example, mm. um, happening at, mm. in Uganda. So that, that's one of the very exciting trials. Um, folks are really on the front lines there, not only assisting with the current, you know, waiting to assist with the current outbreak, but also help wanting to prevent the future outbreaks. Mm -hmm. um, we have been involved in other infectious disease projects like um, the military HIV research program, which has done a, a really remarkable job over the last two decades in helping to identify and control um, some of the, the, the devastating impact of HIV. Mm -hmm. um, it also, we also have exciting opportunities in um, looking at novel diagnostics for uh, folks who suffer a, a major trauma, mm -hmm. and then they need to have surgery to, to put them back to put them back together. But what happens when maybe there's an infection, um, or there's the the wound is contaminated? Well, if you, you can debride it and hopefully get all of that contamination out. But it's really hard to tell when, you have it, when you've gotten enough. Mm -hmm. And so they're working on diagnostics that will help indicate when it's safe to close a wound so that you don't have infectious complications or um, the wound doesn't reopen. That can be potentially hugely saving, not just for the military population, but also for any hospitalized population, and particularly in the critical care fields. So there's a lot happening. It's amazing for, I mean, you're, you're not a small organization, but clearly, I mean, these are, uh, uh, there, there's enough going on here that could make for, you know. Right. So there's also the other um, project that I forgot about is a project for amputees okay. where, they're, where they're looking to transition from uh, using a prosthetic to using an osseo-integrated device. So there's actually a you can think about it as sort of a stem that fits into the residual limb. Okay. And then it's almost, uh, the best way to think about it is a snap fit limb. Wow. So rather than putting, putting your uh, prosthetic on with a socket that works to keep it on by suction, this actually will uh, fit onto the stem that's in the residual limb so that there's not the, the it, it's more of a, stable fit okay so um rather rather than having all the movement and the difficulty trying to keep that prosthetic on the limb it's it's directly integrated okay and that's very exciting so that that uh especially for upper extremity amputees one of the one of the real difficulties is trying to get that prosthetic mm -hmm. to to stay on in a in a stable way sure and in a secure way alongside the research program uh, there is also a section on the foundation's website about technology transfer and commercialization uh, and I find this a very another very interesting topic having you know, myself spent time in most of my time in, in the pharma industry but something that's just not as well known to most of the general public, in the sense that uh, they don't normally think of the, as we, you know, we talk about the translational opportunities, how they transfer from the military to ultimately 
uh, the private sector. Uh, but the, you know, there's, there's this very important cycle of science, technology, ultimately commercialization of things and wealth generation that, that hopefully comes back and funds more in interesting science. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what's going on on that front of the foundation in terms of um, technologies that you are commercializing or partners are commercializing, uh, interesting things that have, you know, are, are approaching the market maybe that you can talk about or have gotten to market recently that, uh, that you know, potential people listening might run into, uh, hopefully not, but <laughs> might run into <laughs> it, in sort of uh, the healthcare uh, scenario outside here um, in, in the near future. Sure, so there's a, it, it is really important to the, the, the researchers that we, that we work with, that their ideas get out into the larger world mm -hmm. because that's, that's really what they're trying to do. Is they're trying to improve healthcare, not just for the military, but for the nation as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so using that um, Joint Office of Technology Transfer to help move those, move those ideas through the, the development process in what we like to think of as the business of research. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and thinking about how to move things from the back of the cocktail napkin all the way out to um, it, into the marketplace is is really important. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, there is a um, we're working on a project to address Nipah Hendra virus, which is a it's a virus in horses that has been largely seen in Australia but it can also have, it can have other impacts. And so we have been working very closely with one of our researchers to develop a vaccine for that. Those are the big ones at the moment. You know, that's the big one at the moment. There are others, but- um, Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't want to say anything confidential. I have to look that one up too, because it's, I never heard of it, but it sounds pretty scary. <laughs> yeah. Too often, you know, people, you know, see, once again, the budgets, the, the large amount of money that goes in this space, and this, it's just, it's a breath of fresh air to see that not only the important work that you're doing with this, but ultimately how it's getting out to everybody else. And I think that's a, a very important uh, message. And you know, not just the U.S., but everywhere, because you know, the United States military right. is everywhere. So right, and just you know, one of the one of the things to keep in mind is that typically um, with the Department of Defense, when when they're looking at proposals to fund. Mm -hmm. So first of all, military investigators have to go through the same pr proposal process that everyone else does. Sure. Um, and when they're looking at the proposals to fund, one of the important things that they often look at is how will this technology be translated into the civilian marketplace? Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's a very important component of the entire development process, is how are we going to move this from the military space out into the public at large. So coming back to you now for some of the wrap up part of the show, um, along your journey through this path to date, uh, where you've, you know, you've been in the private sector, you've been in the military, you've been now in sort of the hybrid area, um, have there been important influencers uh, in on your path that, you know, you can think back and say, you know, if, if it wasn't for such and such, you know, helping me go in a certain direction, you, know, you would, you would have ended up elsewhere. Um, who is, you know, some people that have guided you on this this journey uh, that uh, were important in, I guess, important decision making uh, along the way, uh, such that you find yourself in 2019 where you are. So there, there, there are several. There are several people, um, but I think one of the 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 common theme amongst all the people who helped me get to where I am, mm -hmm. or or um, because I never would have imagined that I would be in this place where I am now and would have worked in, in the area of hand and face transplantation. Sure. Um, the common theme between all of the mentors that I had was um, that they encouraged me not to see limits, mm -hmm. but to see possibility. Excellent. And not only, not only in the work that I was doing, but also in myself. And, and that was, that's really the most important thing that anybody did for me. Yeah, that's a wonderful message, especially, especially in, a, uh, in an area where it's difficult to succeed, <laughs> or it's difficult to have major wins all the time. 
Final question, and then here we go. We trans transition now from science purely into science fiction, but uh, we, we give this to everybody uh, before we, we wrap up the show. But um, if I was to pull out my time machine that I've been building in the other room here and, and let you, Dr. Dean, travel in it anywhere you want to go, um, and you're going to get to meet with one person. It can be anyone you want. Albert Einstein, uh, Sigmund Freud, whomever and talk to them for a little while about something. Uh, who, who would that person be that Dr. Wendy Dean would like to meet? I would really like to meet William Halstead because he, uh, he, was, he was critical and, his, and his, um, the group that he was with in Baltimore uh -huh. was critical to developing um, medical training Ooh. and the medical field as we know it now. Mm -hmm. And I would really, I would just love to see how that group came together and what he, what he was like in developing this program that we have now. I think he was a unique individual and it would give a lot of insight into medical training and the structure of, of medicine as we have it and also in research. With that, um, once again, I, I really appreciate uh, you coming on the show, everything you're doing there. Um, not just for the medical, uh, the, the, the military, but for uh, the, the overall United States public. It's, it's, it's an amazing program, a set of programs you're going on, and really wish you and all your researchers and your staff the, the greatest of success. Uh, we've been talking to Dr. Wendy Dean, Senior Vice President of Operations and Senior Medical Officer at the Henry M. Jackson Foundation for Advancement in Military Medicine. Uh, when the interview goes live, we will have a variety of links to the website so everyone watching can can check out the work and, and all the programs that are going on there. But Dr. Dean, really thank you so much for the work you do and really appreciate you spending this time with us today. It's, it's really been a, a pleasure having you here. Thank you, it's, it's a pleasure for me.